Today we're gonna to be talking about six things that I see short-term rental journey hosts. Whoa, that does not make sense. Let's try that again. Today we're gonna to be talking about six mistakes. That was right, right? Yeah, yeah. Six mistakes that I see short-term rental hosts making every day in their Airbnb journeys. Uh, I can personally speak to these because I have made all of those mistakes. Many times. Anyways, uh, welcome back to the Bigger Pockets YouTube channel. I'm your host for today, Rob Abasolo. Let's jump in. Now, this video was meant to be five tips, but then I realized I missed a huge one. So you're gonna wanna stick around until the end to find out what it is because it could cost you some big money. Mistake number one, panicking too soon. If I had a dollar for every time in my short-term rental journey when I was first getting started, I would just freak out over little things. I wouldn't need to have an Airbnb business because I'd have enough money from that. When it comes to running a short-term rental, you have to remember that you need a team to help you operate that short-term rental, right? It's not gonna be you that's cleaning the home and repairing it and mowing the yard and maintaining the pool. And, I mean, maybe you are doing all that stuff, but eventually as you scale up, it would behoove you to hire out those different roles. So whenever something goes wrong in my Airbnb or something breaks or something catastrophic happens from a maintenance standpoint, I have to remember that I'm hundreds, if not thousands of miles away and I can't fly out to go and fix said problem. So whenever something goes wrong, you have to ask yourself who not how. Who can fix a leaky roof? Who can come and clean my pool that has a hundred leaves in it and looks unsightly because my guest is really mad? Who can come and touch up the cleanliness of my Airbnb because my guests weren't satisfied with the condition? What all of these questions have in common is who, right? Who, not you. I think I'm gonna brand that. Who, not you. That's pretty good, that's my twist on who, not how. I'll give you a quick example here and then we'll move on to number two. A couple months ago, guest called me because there was a leak in the ceiling of my tiny house's kitchen and there was a hole in the ceiling. Now, of course, first temptation is to be like, oh my God, the something's wrong, I'm gonna have to refund them, that place is burning down, I need a new house, I need to sell it all. But instead, I forced myself to take a deep breath and think, okay, how can I get this addressed as soon as possible? Well, I had just built this house in the past two years and I thought, well, this is a fault with my construction, so I'm gonna start with my contractor who built the home. Called the contractor and he says, yep, we warranty our work for two years, let me call my roofer. He calls his roofer, his roofer's like, yep, we warranty it. So they come out and they fix it. And then after that was done, my contractor sent in his drywall guy to come and fix and paint the ceiling. So in that instance, instead of panicking, I just identified very quickly who could solve my problem. I think that's gonna be the most important skill you can learn as a short-term rental host. Who, not you. Mistake number two that I see all the time is not automating a lot of the self-management that comes with running a short-term rental. There are many aspects of your self-management that you can actually outsource to AIs and robots to run your short-term rental business for you. A big one that comes to mind for me is messaging. When I was first getting started, I was the one that was confirming bookings, confirming that with the guests, sending them check-in instructions the day of their check-in, sending them a follow-up message the next day, sending them checkout instructions. So that right there, that's five messages I would have to send to guests every single stay. Now imagine I'm averaging, let's say, 10 stays every single month. That's 50 messages that I send on any given month. Now imagine I have five units and the same rules apply. Now we're talking about 250 messages that I have to send every single month. The point I'm making here is that as an Airbnb guest, you're gonna be sending out a ton of messages. And you're a human, theoretically. But that just means that you're gonna make mistakes because you're not perfect. And you're gonna miss messages just like I was doing when I was first getting started. But with automation, you can actually use different services to template out a lot of the messages that you're sending out. So now I have an automated template that I send out to every single guest when they check in. I send them check-in instructions. The day that they check out, I send them check-out instructions. And then even several days after they check out, I send them an automated message reminding them to leave me a five-star review. This little automation alone can wipe out 50% of the work that comes with managing a short-term rental. So I would very much recommend it. Number three is gonna be automating too soon. So on the flip side of automating, I see people automating way too soon before they've mastered the art of communication with guests. Because at the end of the day, short-term rentals still need a human touch. You can't completely automate your business. You can come pretty close, but Papa and Mama still need to intervene every so often because automations can't do everything. And so what I really encourage people to do when they launch a listing, I really want them to actually manage it manually for at least the first month because it teaches you with how to communicate with the guests that reach out to your specific property. It teaches you a lot of the questions that those guests are gonna ask you so that you can have those questions addressed or the answers prepared for those questions in something like a guidebook that you provide to the guest upon check-in so that they don't ask you the questions. There's just so many reasons why I want you to manually self-manage first because I want you to learn the business, I want you to love the business and master it, and then you can delegate it out to robots like me. I find that when people automate too early, they really depend on the automation, use it as a crutch, and things will start falling through the cracks even more. Whereas if you self-manage manually, you understand all the intricacies of running your short-term rental journey, and you can let automation be complementary to your skill set versus letting it replace your skill set and you entirely. That's when mistakes are made. If you want to learn how I self-manage my own properties, I did a whole video on this on the Rob Belt channel, so be sure to check that out after this one. Mistake number four, 
<laughs> Four, I sort of alluded to this earlier with the automation around reviews, but a big mistake that I see short-term rental hosts making is not asking for a five-star review. I know that this seems like a very simple thing, but if you don't do it, three things can happen. A guest will leave you a five-star review because they like the place and they're proactive reviewers. Number two, they don't ever leave a review because as soon as they're done with it, they just wanna be done with the platform and the app and they're just, they live busy lives. Or number three, they have time to think about the stay and reflect on it. And there's just a higher chance that they might leave you a four-star review over something very, very small. Or they just may not understand that a four-star review is a really big hit to short-term rental hosts, and so they just need to be educated. Now, I will say I'm not a proactive reviewer. I never do it. I'm more in the ghost camp where I'm just like, oh, I'm done with it. I don't even want to open my app. But as an Airbnb host, I know the importance of reviewing, so I do my best to leave a review for hosts, but it's usually because a host reminds me to leave them a review. Now, there's a little bit of an education with asking guests to leave you a five-star review because when my automated message goes out, it typically says something like, hey, so-and-so, we're trying super super hard to earn super host status, or we're trying super hard to maintain our super host status, and we rely on the five-star reviews of our amazing guests like you. If you had an awesome stay, would you mind leaving us a five-star review? And just so you know, there's a private section where you can leave any feedback for me to improve my listing. Thank you so much, and I'll be sure to leave you a five-star review too. So just in that alone, asking for the five-star review is super powerful because now they know that you're a small business and the five-star review is the lifeblood of your business. And so I've really found that this has dramatically increased the amount of five-star reviews that I get. And all of this is true by a simple messaging automation that I send out three days after they check out. See, all of this works together. It's a spider web of cool things and robots. Number five that I see short-term rental hosts making is giving discounts to guests. There's a bit of this culture right now that's going around on Airbnb and Verbo and Booking.com where guests will reach out and say, hey, I love your place. Will you give me 90% off or 70% off or a 25% discount? Whatever discount that they ask for. And I always say no 100% of the time. In my opinion, a discount asking guest that gets the discount that they asked for, they will not only ask for a discount, but they will be the pickiest people that you ever host and they will find so many problems within your property that it'll just be a maintenance nightmare. Trust me, it's like clockwork. It literally happens all the time. Anyways, even when I offer the discount and the guest concedes, they still end up being super, super picky and they will get their discount in the end because they will ask for a refund on the smallest thing. So I would just be very careful in developing your discount policy. There's some instances in which a discount might make sense, like a medium term rental. If someone wants a monthly discount, they don't wanna pay your full market rate for a short term rental for 30 days. That makes sense. Or maybe a travel nurse discount or maybe a military discount. You'll have to form those philosophies yourself, but people who are just asking for money just because they want money off, I always avoid these people and I'll give one really quick example. One time Time, I gave someone a discount and then it proceeded to turn into an intruder in my closet. Airbnb support. There's someone in the closet. <laughs> There's someone in my closet. It wasted eight hours of my time and then it turned out that no one was in the closet at all. The person just thought they heard something and got scared and got in their head. And that was really the time that I formed my discount philosophy of never giving a discount to anybody. Final note here that I'll move on. A discount guest will always leave you a discounted review. So if you do give the discount, most of the time when I get a four star review, it's from people who have asked for a discount and gotten the discount. Because like I said, they're just always very picky. I don't know why. Hope I didn't make too many of you mad, but if you're watching this and you're like, oh my gosh, I've been asking for discounts for for my whole time while I've been on air. Don't do it. We're a small business, we've got to pair people to offer this awesome service to you where you can stay in a home for a really great price and then make memories with your family. All right, okay. Number six, we made it. Perhaps the biggest mistake that short-term rental hosts make is cheaping out on furniture. When I was first getting started in Airbnb, I was getting everything off of the free section on Craigslist. I was getting stuff for like 10 bucks on let go. And while it's totally fine to buy used furniture, you can get really premium furniture at a discount if you hustle for it. What I was doing was just trying to get the cheapest furniture to fill up the space. I didn't care what it looked like or what the quality was. I just wanted to fill up the room with furniture. And then I started getting more and more short-term rentals and filling those short-term rentals up with Ikea, and a bunch of Target furniture and sometimes Walmart furniture and it would just fall apart on me all the time because while that furniture might be okay when you use it, when a guest is using it and moving it around and opening it and slamming it shut, the cheap furniture tends to fall apart because the guests don't care about the furniture in the same way that you might care about the furniture. And this is why I really say to a lot of people that you should buy nice, not thrice. Because if you buy cheap furniture, it's gonna break down on you. And then if you don't learn from that mistake, you're gonna buy it again. And then you have to hire someone to dispose of the first set of furniture. Then you have to hire someone to assemble the new furniture. And then when that breaks, you're gonna end up buying the nice version of it because you're gonna say, oh yeah, I should have just spent the money to begin with. And at that point, you have bought the same thing three times. So save the money one time, buy nice, cry once. That's the phrase, right? Buy once, cry once. That's what my father always used to tell me. Miss you, dad. Call me back. 
Anyways, you can get some quality stuff from Ikea and Target, just don't get all of your furniture from there. I typically splurge in places like World Market. It's a little bit more of an upgraded version of Ikea and it's not too much more expensive. I also like places like West Elm. They've got a lot of contractor grade furniture, Pottery Barn, and nicer furniture stores like that in general. But I promise you, if you spend the money on good furniture, not only is your place going to look better, your photography is also gonna look better. And if your photography looks better, then people are gonna click it more. And if people click your listing more, they're gonna book you more. And if they book you more, you're gonna make more money. So that's why it could be worth it to spend 10, $15,000 more on furniture because it'll make you more in the long run of your short-term rental journey. Wow. It's like I rehearsed that, which I did for hours. Anyways, thanks for tuning into the Bigger Pockets YouTube channel. And thanks to everyone that stuck around until the very end. If you did, you're a super fan. And if you're a super fan, please let me know in the comments down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more. And I'll see you here on the channel pretty, uh-oh, <laughs> unprofessional. And I'll see you here on the channel pretty soon. Bye.